Okay, guys. Good morning. We got still about um, four minutes till class time. Just getting things started as usual. Hope you all had a good weekend. And let's just get prepared, and we'll be there in a few minutes to start class. <clears throat> Hey, Dimitri. Hi, Grant. How's it going? <clears throat> Hi, Ryan. <clears throat> Finn, good to see you. Abby, welcome back. And Stephen, good to see you too. <clears throat> Just a few minutes. Hey, Brian. <clears throat> Kylie, Alex, Nicole. Hey, everybody. Good morning. If any of you young folks that are student age like you guys have had this vaccine or set up an appointment for it, I know it's hard to get unless you're in a, one of the eligible categories, but I've heard stories of some young people just getting lucky with like leftover reserve vaccine doses that they had to distribute instead of discard. So like that's a question I have just out of curiosity. I wonder if there's any of you guys at all that have gotten that first dose. If so, I would love to know. Oh, and that's good, Ryan. Good, good news. I'd love to know how first dose feels. I'm going to get my first shot on Saturday, the, this coming Saturday, the 13th. I've heard some people say it kind of lays you out a little bit, makes you get headaches and stuff, but whatever. My 84-year-old uncle, I was just talking to him over the weekend. He just, you know, he got his. He's feeling fine. So I decided I got to get moving on this and make my appointment. If my old relatives are doing it before me and they're, they're – you know, it's saying they're feeling great. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, guys. Well, welcome back. It's pretty much 9 a.m. now, so I'm going to let us get started again. Thank you for being here, and hope you all had a good weekend. Um, so, yeah, let me just kind of bring you back into our current topic. We were working through the notes on um, Peter Singer's Rich and Poor, and um, we mostly finished everything, but there's just a couple of last things to wrap up. So let me just uh, close that discussion by coming back to – notes of it for a minute. Okay, so in Peter Singer's article, Rich and Poor, as you guys now know, he's, he's arguing overall toward the conclusion that we have a moral obligation to assist the global poor, the third world poor, living in absolute poverty. And just going to tell you a couple of main things in his paper. He starts off by just mentioning that absolute poverty is having not enough income or wealth to meet the basic human needs of food, clothing, and shelter. And there's over a billion people in the world living that way. Um, it's a major source of human misery. It really makes people's lives difficult, short. A lot of children even die of starvation each year in the third world. So he says, isn't there something that we in the first world would have, which, you know, where we have absolute affluence, is there anything that we can do to um, improve on the current situation? Um, well, he says some people would say, no, there's nothing that can be done because there's not enough resources, but he denies that. He says the problem is not scarcity, but maldistribution and waste. Uh, for reasons that we talked about before. And um, so he asked the question, if we have surplus wealth and we're able to prevent some preventable death in the third world through charity or aid, and we withhold on the aid, is that anything closer in any way comparable to killing? 
Um, but then he mentions what are differences between killing and failing to assist. So, you know, like um, different motive, um, different degree of certainty of the outcome, identifiability of the victim, et cetera. He went back over those points and tried to illustrate through examples and discussion that um, none of those really make the case that uh, failure to assist is completely blameless, that there's still some degree of moral blame attached to it, even if perhaps killing is worse. So he returns to his main theme of argument, which is that we have an obligation to assist, and he states the obligation to assist argument, which now um, we've learned about, and it says overall, um, if you can prevent a bad thing without making a comparable sacrifice, then you should, and absolute poverty is bad, and we can prevent some without making a comparable sacrifice, so therefore we should. And he backs this argument with some defense involving the case of the drowning child scenario. He says, if you have intuitions that easy rescue is an obligation for you when you can do it without making major sacrifices, like in the case of the drowning child, then he thinks the same intuitions hold in this case of giving international aid, where the assistance is easy for you to give, but it has a life-saving impact on those who receive it. Um, he thinks it's an obligation yet again. So we got to the end of the article where he starts talking about objections to the obligation to assist argument. And that's where we ran out of time. So I'm going to take about 10 minutes or so to just brief you on these objections to his argument one more time and then try and explain at least um, short form uh, how he rebuts those objections or how he tries to rebut the objections. So here are various objections to Peter Singer's obligation to assist argument. Obligation to assist argument. Okay, so each one I'm giving these uh, memorable titles to, so that's easy enough to remember. So you've got um, take care of our own. Property rights. <clears throat> triage, and uh, leave it to the government. <clears throat> okay, so these are different objections that he uh, mentions following on after he states the argument of the obligation to assist. So again, he's just trying to voice this, the position of his critic or his opponent so that he can show awareness of it and then kind of try to push back. Um, so taking care of our own, that's one objection, and I'll just brief it, briefly summarize it. That would be a person who says, no, I don't have an obligation to assist the international third world poor stretched and spread throughout the whole planet. If I have an obligation to care for anyone or uh, any people, it's a more limited set of, um, of individuals. It's a more narrow set. It's just people that are somehow my own, people that are my own people that I know that I'm related to or that I have some kind of connection with. So one could argue that the limitations of my moral obligation pretty much cease once you go beyond the borders of your own country. So maybe you have obligations to take care of uh, your family, your friends, maybe your domestic citizens in the United States that are poor, but not a more wide range of people than that. So that's one possible objection that the claimed moral obligation is too broad in its scope. Um, I don't have obligations to take care of all that need help, but merely my own. Another objection could be property rights. Okay, so the property rights objection merely says that with regard to your property, you have the right to oversee it and manage it in whatever way you want. So you can um, consider your wealth and your income to be a part of your property, even though people ordinarily consider the term property to refer to the things that you purchase with the wealth. The wealth itself, which is derived from your labor, um, or whatever other means, is your property too, prior to being spent on any goods or services. Just sitting in the bank, the wealth that you've earned is your property. Once tax has been deducted from the government, that's your take-home income and pay, and that's your property, part of it anyway. So with property rights, we have the right to do what we wish with our property and not what we don't want, even if those things are foolish, unwise, or not even necessarily beneficial, even to yourself. So if you want to buy a bunch of alcohol and drink it and like destroy your body, I guess that's your freedom um, with the property rights that you have according to your wealth. So people are not even obligated to do things that are beneficial to themselves, much less others with their property rights. So if you want to withhold on aid, spend it on silly things, waste it, just throw it out, uh, you know, spend money and destroy the items that you buy, 
these are all silly and maybe unwise things to do, but you have the right to do them. So someone could say that the argument which says I have an obligation to assist stands in the way of my property rights, which entitle me to do as I wish with my wealth, including not to give it to aid. Then let me say triage for last, it's a little more complex. Leave it to the government is a simple objection. That just says it's really not the obligation of individual citizens to help address this problem, but if there's anything or or institution that should be doing something, it would be the state, the government as a whole, um, because individual charitable contributions are fickle and they're inconsistent. They depend on a person's whim as to whether they feel like they should give or not. But if it was done on the basis of like a government policy, then we would all be mutually invested in it from the tax revenues collected from all the citizens. There'd be a more reliable funding mechanism. And so maybe that's the better way to look at it, that it's not the personal obligation of citizens, but the state. Then there's triage, okay? So about triage, let me just hone in on this triage objection for a minute. Triage is a medical policy that's adopted in mass casualty emergencies or medical scenarios where you have too many people that are either sick or dying or injured and not enough uh, medical personnel or resources to provide care for each one, at least not right away. So, you know, if there was like a massive, um, massive casualty terrorist attack and you didn't have enough available medics and ambulances and stuff, then you'd have to make very tough decisions about how to ration out the scarce resources to make the best impact on saving as many lives as possible. So a triage technician basically assesses the scene and divides those that are injured into three categories. So <clears throat> here are the three categories of triage. Let me try and maybe I actually need a little more room to talk to since we talked about the other two objections above. Here's how the triage system works. So you have three different divisions. Here on this side, let's say you have people um, so injured, so injured that they'll probably die, sadly. Um, even with help. So the injuries are so serious or severe that they'll probably die even with help. Even if you provided aid, this is a category of people who are kind of like beyond help, lost cause, still alive, wanting help, but unfortunately it's futile because they're too far gone. And on the other extreme, you have the opposite case. These are people um, with such light injuries, so minor injuries, that they'll probably survive even without help. Okay, so this is like the group of people who are the walking wounded. They're, they're hurt. Everyone on this spectrum is a little bit injured, but or not just a little bit, but to some degree injured. But in this case, the injuries are pretty minor. So although I guess medical attention would be nice, it's not absolutely essential for their survival here. These people could walk away with the injuries they have and be attended to later. So they're not as urgent and their lives are not really at risk from the nature of their injuries. But then in this middle group, this is the all important kind of category that's on the bubble. So these are the people whose injuries are such that um, if you don't help them, they'll probably die. And if you do help them, they'll probably live. So with this group, the immediate attention makes all the difference between life and death. In this group, pretty much as much attention as you could give probably wouldn't make a difference. And in this group, the attention is kind of unwise to give because they don't need it as bad as this mother, other more urgent category. So injuries such that they'll probably uh, live with help or die without help. Okay, so this is how triage is set up. You gotta now um, assign care in the first wave of available medical resources in a, in a way that's going to ensure the greatest amount of survivors and the greatest amount of life saved. So would you send that initial wave of medics over to this category? Of course not, because while you're attending to people whose wounds are not grave enough to kill them, other people are dying without help. So that would be a waste of resources that could have saved life. Of course, in the other case, you would also not send them to this group, which is sad because they're gravely injured, but this is a group where medical attention and resources are gonna be most likely wasted while the people die anyway. And over here, the same level of attention could have actually prevented death. So in that first, 
you know, critical wave of medical resources that arrive, you divert them to the middle group with injuries that are on that kind of bubble. Now, how does this serve as an objection to Peter Singer's argument? Now we're getting to the bigger picture. Well, it's kind of like an objection because to some critics, anybody who says, let's give resources and assistance to the poorest people in the third world that are literally going to starve if they don't get help, uh, that you could argue that this is a violation of the logic of triage because it's like saying, let us assist and attend to the needs of the most gravely affected group, which basically, according to the logic of triage, is like a lost cause. So, of course, first world nations not in need of any assistance don't need that kind of aid. But the poorest of the poor, he's also saying, are just too far gone to actually literally be lifted up out of poverty by the means of this kind of temporary band-aid of international aid and food aid. So... Who would, if anyone received the, the legitimate aid, it would be those developing countries that are making a transition to a higher living standard. But that's not the poorest of the poor who are mentioned and targeted by the argument of Peter Singer. So you can argue that it's well intended, but it's just as foolish as seeking to provide massive aid and resources to a category of people that are beyond help. Okay, and then there was um, the reactions, the rebuttals that he has to these different objections. So I kind of want to make short work of that because obviously we kind of need to move on, but here's how Mr. Peter Singer replies to each of those objections, okay? So I'm just going to talk to you about how he replies to them quickly, and then we move forward to the next essay. Um, so what he says, first of all, about the taking care of our own, <clears throat> he has some straightforward, I think, legitimate you know, a reaction to that, which is this. How close or how far someone is from you, he says, maybe makes a difference to how much you feel about like helping them or, or how much you care about their needs. There is a saying that says out of sight, out of mind, right? And so the third world poor that we're talking about are in a sense out of sight because they're way out in the third world and you're not being served up with images and video of them on a regular basis. So you can kind of ignore it. Um, but what Peter Singer is telling you is that just because something's not within your sight and therefore out of mind, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So these people with needs that are starving and hungry are real people that do need things, that need help. And he says, what we ought to do should not be dictated by how close we feel towards individuals, but what their actual human needs really are. Furthermore, he says this, um, how could we prioritize the less pressing needs of our own over the urgent life and death needs of people that are not our own? You know, because if you're living in the first world, like a United States citizen, your own people are basically doing fine. Uh, they're not starving to death. They're not you know, at the brink of um, starvation or whatever. So how could we say, well, let's make sure to take care of those people before people who are actually in much more dire need. That seems to get the prioritization backwards, helping people with less pressing needs over those with more pressing needs. So that's another thing he says. Finally, he says this. It's a bit arbitrary, he thinks, for you to determine the limits of your obligations through geography, like just wherever the borders of the United States end, that's where your moral obligations terminate. And he says, um, proximity to how close you are has no more to do with human needs than like race does. So he says, what if somebody told you, I only care about my own, but what I mean my own, I mean people that look like me. In my case, that would just be white people. Normally you would say that that's, um, that's a racial way of thinking, that's racist, that's biased, that's discriminatory. So how is it any more principled to say I only care about members of my own nation rather than members of my own race? He feels that they're both equally illegitimate stances to hold. So that's how he moves in reacting to the taking care of our own objection, that our own people are basically well off and doing fine, so it'd be strange to care more for them than the third world poor, and that the geographic limitations of philanthropic concern are kind of arbitrary and just as poorly motivated, he thinks, as racial thinking about who your own people are. So anyway, he moves on. Next, property rights. What about property rights? Well, he says that... Um, in one way, he says, okay, fair enough, you do have your property rights, and I guess, in a sense, those do give you the freedom to withhold on aid if you don't want to give it, but the question is not what you have the right to do, but what's morally proper or um, good to do, and he says, many things that you're entitled to do under the law that are part of your rights are not necessarily all things considered wise or good, even for you. Do you have the property right today to, I don't know, um, just withdraw all the funds that you have and like buy an expensive item and like, do I have the property right today to buy a Rolex watch and then 
Smash it with a hammer? Yes, that's my right. If I bought it, then it would be my property. And if I wanted to destroy it afterwards, it would be f my freedom to do that. But is that a good thing for me or for anybody else? Not really. So there's more argument to be given, he thinks, than just saying you have the right to withhold on aid. The question is not whether you have a legal right to do that, but whether morally, all things considered, it's what you should do or not. Um, so having a right to do something is not the same as it being true that you ought to do it. Do you guys all have the right to drop out of college today if you really don't want to continue taking classes? Sure, you have that right, but I don't think it's a good decision for you or for your future, so I wouldn't advise you to do it. So the same way he's saying you may have the right to withhold on aid, but the question is, is that good? Not whether you have the right to do it. And so some things that you have the right to do are not good decisions and they're not right morally. Um, finally, he also says this. He knows that he's writing this paper to a Western audience, and so most people are going to be Christians. And so he thinks, um, isn't it a little bit inconsistent with Christian doctrine to say that I have the right to not give money to the poor, and it's, you know they should get their own money, they should earn it, and they should work harder. I don't care about them. In fact, if you study the Bible, and the New Testament especially, Jesus Christ says over and over that you should have supreme concern for the least well-off among us. There are all kinds of fine passages in the scriptures like, it is harder for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Uh, you should be your brother's keeper. The meek shall inherit the earth, and on and on and on. So if you were just listening to the teachings of Jesus, you would not be told something like, the poor are not um, hardworking enough. They're losers. You're a winner. The winners win. The losers lose. Just keep on consolidating your advantages over those that are less fortunate. It doesn't say that in the Bible. So he says um, two things. Number one, even if you have these rights, should you act that way according to those rights? And number two, if you profess to believe in Christian ideology and scripture, then how can you reconcile that with a calloused and indifferent attitude towards the global poor? Um, about triage, this whole thing, he says, well, it sounds like the triage person is saying, withdraw help from the people that are in the most severe need. And then eventually through natural causes, you know, their numbers will dwindle as the effect of famine and pestilence does its work. And then you have a more manageable cohort of people that could possibly be served with assistance in the future. But, you know, Peter Singer thinks this shows a lack of proper respect for human life. Uh, wouldn't a more humane alternative to withdrawing assistance and hoping for the death rate to increase, uh, to provide assistance and hope for the birth rate to decrease? So one of the problems that's mentioned by triage is that the overpopulation of the third world, which is in some ways fed into by international aid, is part of the problem that we are facing because you have too many poor people, and they don't start to reproduce in slower numbers, then you just set up the problem to be a bigger problem that's delayed for another generation into the future. But Peter Singer notes that um, international aid is actually effective at reducing birth rates through contraceptive access, uh, education and emancipation of women, um, and higher living standards. So if we really wanted the population size to dwindle and get s smaller in the third world so that this triage problem isn't such a big deal, and he actually thinks uh, international aid is the exact way to go to bring down birth rates, whereas withdrawing aid would increase death rates. Both would achieve a goal of reducing the population size of the poorest parts of the world, but one is involving massive death and the other is just lower rates of birth. So obviously that's a better, more humane alternative because people don't die in that case. Finally, though, leaving it to the government, that's an easy one, he says. Well, the problem with that objection is why not do both, basically? So. Can individuals give and the government? Yeah. And he says that's probably better than just putting it all on the government because the government is probably not going to initiate a program of charitable aid against the expressed wishes of the people. And since they can see how much we charitably donate, um, it, wouldn't, it would probably be more um, amenable to the goal of getting more aid to the poor if individuals gave privately and would probably also incentivize the government to give more on its, on its behalf too. So. He says, there's no real reason to see these two things as mutually exclusive, private charitable aid and government aid to the poor. Um, more is better, so why not do both? And that's why he denies the leaving it to the government objection. But anyway, guys, okay, just a little commentary on the remaining points within Peter Singer. Now we can move on from that. And we're going to take a quick look at the other side of this argument, right? So I say there's two sides, and there are. So there's also this guy, Garrett Hardin. Okay, Garrett Hardin, he has a completely different point of view, and we're going to learn about it. So his article is called um, Lifeboat Ethics.
And then just like a film, it has like one of those like sub names, lipoethics, colon, the case against helping the poor. <clears throat> His overall argument is actually quite similar to the triage objection that Peter Singer was just discussing. So that kind of gives you a window into how he's going to move in the argument. Um, and yet his overall position is that assistance to the third world poor is neither obligatory, but even furthermore, he says not, not even helpful or beneficial in the end if you study the long-term consequences of the aid. At least that's his argument. So we'll try and see why he thinks that. And I'm just looking at the dates here. He, Garrett Hardin lived from 1915 until 2003. So that's the span of his life. I remember reading him when I was starting college myself and Back then, I thought that some of his ideas were pretty interesting. I kind of don't agree so much with a lot of it now, having grown and changed a little bit. But anyway, this came from 1974, the paper Lifeboat Ethics that we're going to read. Okay, so Garrett Hardin, Lifeboat Ethics from 1974. The case against helping the poor. Wow, kind of a stark title there. He really is not leaving anything to doubt. He's trying to make the case against helping the poor. So... <clears throat> When he begins the paper, he starts by calling out a metaphor that was common at the time among a new wave of environmentalists, which was kind of like a new movement dawning on the Western world in the 70s and, of course, till the current day. For a long time in human history, obviously, the effects of um, human behavior and industry would not have had a noticeable impact on the quality of the environment and our resources. But as we get into the 20th and now 21st century, we start to notice a much bigger human impact on the world and the, and the world of nature. So environmentalism kind of comes to the fore as like this new concept that people are concerned with. And some of the nascent, you know, early um, members of the environmentalist movement were making this argument that Garrett Hardin didn't like. And so he criticizes one metaphor that was popular among environmentalists of spaceship Earth. So let me put this point that he says, um, Hardin dislikes the quote unquote spaceship earth metaphor of then, then current environmentalists. Okay, so what is this metaphor that he doesn't like? He calls it the spaceship Earth metaphor, and so what it was is the idea that we live on one planet that we all share. So the spaceship thing is just trying to imply that it's one home for all of us. Like we're all riding along on this big floating blue ball that's a spaceship, as it were, floating through space, and we're all passengers on the big spaceship. So it's trying to emphasize that if we all share life on this one vessel, kind of described as though it were a ship, then no single person, nation, or institution has the right to destroy waste or use more than their fair share of the resources. So if it's like our common home, you know, one planet for one um, you know, human civilization, then we have to share it, make sure that we manage the resources properly and equitably. Um, so it's trying, it's like a call to sustainability. It's a call to uh, moderation and consumption and to attend to the global needs of our human population. But Garrett Hardin doesn't like the metaphor and he has problems with it like this. He says, the metaphor implies that we all have an equal right to an equal share of the world's resources as we're riding along on this spaceship. But he says, that's not true. If we really operated according to the metaphor, it would usher in what he calls self-destructive suicidal policies for the sharing of global resources. It would divest the wealth that's been accumulated from the wealthier nations, thus removing these beacons of prosperity that all the poorer nations and third world citizens look to as kind of like an aspirational goal of wealth, security, and prosperity. Uh, I don't know if this is a perfect example, but I think kind of like Garrett Hardin would say something like this, like, okay, so suppose you live in a nice home and you have certain rooms that are just open, like guest rooms, additional bedrooms. And of course there are people out there homeless just sleeping in the open air with no roof. What if you came home one time and you saw a homeless person was there and they said to you, you know, I understand I don't own this home and it's yours, but I sleep um, on the street and you have bedrooms that no one is sleeping in. So don't you think I have a right to access some of those rooms because we're all human beings and we share this planet together. And so, you know, your sukasa mikasa type thing. Um, well, 
we probably would reject that argument even if we felt some degree of sympathy for the person because we would stand on our property rights and we would say, well, some people are entitled to have a greater access to the world's wealth and resources than others given their prior history and so on. So another reason he doesn't like the metaphor, not just because it would imply sharing of resources in a way that's intuitively um, contrary to our intuitions, but also a true spaceship would have to be run by a single kind of captain. There's no such thing as a ship that can just be floating in the sea, but no one's steering it. Um, and in the planet Earth, there is no such captain, right? So there's no like sovereign authority over the planet Earth. There's no president of Earth. What we do have is the United Nations, but he points out that it's not a true international or global authority because it only has the power to enforce its mandates through the agreement of the member nations and treaties that they enter into. So um, without like an actual so-called captain, the spaceship Earth metaphor is even less fitting because there's no centralized control as the metaphor would indicate. So um, just how Peter Singer tried to utilize different statistical facts and figures in constructing his argument for the obligation to assist, Garrett Hardin makes use of stats in his own way to try and make the contrary conclusion. So he points out to us that two-thirds of the world's nations are poor, so the majority of the world's nations are in relative poverty, and one-third of the world's nations are wealthy with the United States, as I've said before, the wealthiest of all right at the top of that wealth pyramid. So he wants us to imagine a different metaphor that he thinks describes our situation more appropriately and accurately than the, the spaceship earth metaphor. And that is the lifeboat example. So um, here I'm going to draw some stuff on the board so we can understand Garrett Hardin's lifeboat scenario. And this lifeboat thing is like the core example and idea that drives his whole essay forward. So this is fundamental to knowing about what he's saying. He says, all right, I would like you to, if you can, imagine that each wealthy nation in the world is represented by a lifeboat floating in the ocean. So, for example, here's a boat, and let's just say this is Lifeboat USA. And look, here it is, you and me and everyone else. These people, who are they in the boat? They're the citizens of the United States. So it's a metaphor. Our country is symbolized by this boat. The people that are riding in it are symbols of the citizens that are, you know, of that country. And for every wealthy nation, there's another boat in the ocean. So like this is Lifeboat USA, but over here there's like Lifeboat Japan, Lifeboat Germany, Britain, etc. So for every wealthy first world industrialized nation, they're symbolized by such a boat. Okay, but that's not the only um, individuals in the example. <clears throat> there's also people out here that are in the water And life is tough for the people in the water because they don't have the safety and security of the boat. By the way, the USA lifeboat, I guess, because we're the wealthiest, is the nicest, biggest, maybe has the nicest amenities and everything. But anyway, uh, in the water, it's really tough. People that are in the water are struggling just to survive and stay above the waves. Um, no safety, no security, constantly at threat of, of death. So who are they to stand for? They stand for the global poor in the third world. Um, the kind of people described by Peter Singer living in absolute poverty, facing starvation and death. So um, let's pursue the metaphor a bit further, he says. So first of all, one thing to know is that any boat, whether it's a lifeboat or a larger vessel, has a limited carrying capacity. You can't pack an unlimited infinite number of people onto such a boat because it would then you know, sink and no longer be able to support the people on it. So um, he says the same thing is true of nations. We are also limited in our capacity to support a, a population. Um, even a nation as wealthy and bountiful as the United States doesn't have an unlimited am amount of money or resources to care for every person in the world that would like help or that would need help. So going further with his metaphor, he says, let's play with some numbers. Suppose that in this boat, USA or whatever, we have 50 people that are currently sitting in there and it has a capacity of 60. So there's 50 people out of a 60 person capacity on the USA boat. Now, um, suppose that out here in the water, so this is the number N of people on the lifeboat. Suppose that in the water we have a uh, hundred people, a hundred people that are out there in the water. So that's a greater number of course than we have on the boat. And uh, I think the reason that he's chosen these numbers basically is to reflect the, the ratio of wealthy to poor nations over, overall internationally. Because as he said, there's two thirds of the world's nations are poor, 
one third of the world's nations wealthy. So uh, 150, if that's the number, two thirds of it is 100. So this kind of just mirrors the case of the distribution of wealth versus poverty in, in the world. Okay, so the question now is this, say we have 50 in our boat and there's room for 10 more, but that's about it. And we see 100 people that are currently not in the boat that are in the water swimming, but they're begging and they're asking, can we get some help? Can you help us maybe let us on the boat? So um, you can maybe guess where Gerhardt Harden is taking this. He's kind of constructed this crude analogy or metaphor to help him make his argument. And what he's saying is this, what should we do then about those that are in the water if we're already on the boat? Take the standpoint of a citizen that's standing in this lifeboat with regard to the people out here asking for help, what should we do with them or to them or for them? He says, well, um, and let me just make a quick side note. Uh, throughout the paper, one thing that I think is like not as, it's almost unprofessional to me in a way, but like Garrett Hardin, he kind of laces his argument with like these kind of cynical um, attempts at dark humor at different points. I mean, maybe that's what it is, but it just comes across as a little bit cringy to me because he like, you know, uh, he, he almost wants to like make light of or make fun of a person who has a more humanitarian cast of mind than he does, like as if they're just so naive and, you know, so it would have been one thing if he just makes his argument, but I thought he goes a little overboard with the rhetorical asides where he kind of is like, isn't that foolish or unwise, but whatever. Here's one of those cases. He says, so suppose you're like a big Christian or a Marxist, you know, and you think be my brother's keeper or to each according to their needs, right? One of these kind of fine phrases. And you want to take in all 100 to the lifeboat. Well, you know what would happen then. And, of course, do you guys see where he's, like, leading this? If you let on all 100, that'll never work. Why not? Well, because then you'll overwhelm the capacity of the boat to support people. And it'll be overloaded with people. It will capsize. And then everyone on the boat drowns. So that's a disaster. Trying to help the people, even if it was done with the best of intentions, will overwhelm the capacity of this boat, making it unsuitable for anybody. And then it can't even support a smaller number as it did before. So he says, if you have this idea of complete justice, helping everyone that wants help, then you're wrong. Complete justice is a complete catastrophe. So like rhetoric like this. Um, well, you know, it's a weird example in a way because it's not exactly perfectly parallel to the case that we have mentioned. We're talking about giving aid to the poor. He's almost talking about like letting people board our vessel. It's slightly different. But anyway, if we allow him his example, he says, let's try another option. What about not taking in all 100? Because that's a, clearly not going to work for anybody. What about just 10, though? I mean, the bus, sorry, boat, we said has room for 10 more. So there's 100 here. That's too many to take safely. But what about just 10? I mean, the boat does have room for 10. Therefore, couldn't we let that extra 10 on, max out the capacity, and save at least some people? Um, well, in this case, he says there's still a problem very tough customer, this hardened. He says, it's still an issue though with letting even 10, because if you let 10, what you've done is you've now filled the boat to absolute capacity, 60 of 60. And uh, that means that you've actually compromised this critical principle of the safety margin, the safety factors. Usually you'd like to leave a little bit of additional excess space or room in any kind of vessel or classroom or, you know, lobby. Sometimes you see a note on the wall of a public building. It'll say from the fire marshal, here's the safest amount of people that can collect in this room before it's unsafe in the event of like an orderly evacuation or emergency. So he says, there's still a cost to taking on 10. I mean, it makes us less safe on the boat because now it's filled to capacity and therefore you've eliminated that extra safety margin. So he says, there's one other option and it's the one that he advises, but of course it's the most harsh of all. And that is to Diligently guard against anyone coming on and make sure that nobody adds to the number that's already there on this lifeboat. That's what he says would preserve the safety factor, not letting anyone on. He said that would ensure that the continued prosperity and um, thriving of the people that are already on the boat continues uninterrupted. It's the only one that can ensure that continued level of prosperity and survival. But he says, oh, to many people, it will seem abhorrent. Um, since it involves neglecting the needs and turning aside from those that are in the most dire straits of global poverty. Um, and once again, we see an example of Garrett Hardin's kind of cynical, um, uh, I don't know, humor, if, if you will, because he says, okay, if you're one of the people who has a guilty conscience, you know, you've been born in one of these nice lifeboats, so you're like a citizen of the first world, and you see that there are so many people starving around the globe, and you feel guilty that they are starving while you're basically living well. 
just because of the circumstances of your birth, right? He says, if you feel that guilty about your good fortune and good luck to be already a passenger on these boats, then you know what you can do. And I'm sure you can understand what he'll say next. It's that whole love it or leave it thing. So he's like, if you, if you're that guilty to be on this boat, enjoying prosperity and the best things life has to offer while some people starve and die, uh, then maybe you could just switch places with them, yield your place. You know, say, hey, come on up here and I'll get out in the water. And then we don't change the number of people on the boat. We keep the ratio the same, except the person who joins the boat has not got the guilty conscience, because if they did, they wouldn't ask to take your place. Once again, though, I feel like this is a, a rhetorical aside, but it kind of, the metaphor gets off the rails a bit, because this no longer corresponds to anything that could happen in reality. Like, there's no system in place where I can say to any citizen of the third world, hey, would you like to become a citizen of the United States in, in place of me, and we will just swap our statuses. So, you know, I mean, you understand the point he's making kind of like, don't be so guilty about being prosperous and fortunate to live in the first world and to be born there. Or if you are, you could just trade with a poor person. But I mean, it's something people could say to make a point rhetorically, but it doesn't correspond to like a real policy. But anyway, that's his basic metaphor. So he says, with this metaphor in place, let's discuss further how it applies to the situation of the rich and the poor nations in the world. Now, one of the things that he argues here is, um, you know, it's at least it's at least a point to consider, even though I don't agree in the end with his conclusions, but he has this reasoning. He says, let's consider the rates of reproduction that you see in the first and then the third world. So um, you might be, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, what do you think? In what kind of case does reproduction happen more rapidly and when? in what kind of nation do um, people generate more children? in a wealthy nation or in a poor nation? Like, where do you think reproduction happens more rapidly, frequently, et cetera? More reproduction happening in the first or the third world, where there's wealth or where there's less wealth? Do you have any view or guess about that? Because there's a definite answer. So, Ryan, you think that there's more population reproduction happening in the wealthy world? Oh, definitely not. So I got to inform you. It's completely the opposite. In the third world, where there's way more poverty and less wealth, there's way, way, way more reproduction, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, for one, uh, since infant mortality rates are much higher in the third world, people have additional children just to offset the possible losses that will happen when many children die in you know, the first few years of life. Another thing is this. There's also, um, in many of these parts of the world where poverty persists and is the norm, women are not as fully equal as men are socially. So statistics and studies have shown that when women don't have equal status to men in society, they don't get to make the same kind of careful family planning decisions. And that also re results in like larger family sizes and more children. Um, also in many of these parts of the world, like I said before, you kind of, in many cases, just for survival, have to have communal living situations where extended families band together and sometimes having additional children to help provide for the meager amount of income uh, wealth and food sustenance that people can derive that sometimes is helpful to supporting the survival of a bigger collective like that. Um, and, um, and access to contraception. Contraceptive access in the first world is much more easy, it's much more normal and acceptable than in many parts of the third world, so that's kind of a recipe for a lot more children where you have uh, higher infant mortality rates, people having more children, women having less impact and input into family planning decisions and weaker access to contraceptives. So it's kind of in a way a sad fact because that means that in parts of the world which have the least capacity to take care of a large burgeoning population, that's where most of the population growth is happening. But in wealthy nations like the United States, population growth is certainly on the decline. People are having smaller and smaller amount of children, um, delaying it more into the future. And so the fact is that because of these differences, the rate of population doubling in the first world and the third world is much different. So wealthy nations, population times two. <clears throat> How long will it take a wealthy nation like the United States to double its population size? Well, if current patterns persist uninterrupted, Obviously, we imagine there could be some upper bound to this just because of like the limits of how many people the planet could support in general. But given current rates, the wealthy nation's population will double every approximately 87 years. So if it's uh, 2021 right now, that means that we have around like 300 million Americans. We would get to 600 million if, if, again, if the pattern remains uninterrupted. 
uh, at around the turn of like the 22nd century, 2107 or something, 2108. But poor nations are reproducing and doubling in size much faster. So their population would double approximately every 35 years. <clears throat> so um, that's more than twice as fast. So since resources globally are dwindling, as people are reproducing and getting more numerous, the difference in prosperity between the wealthy and the poor, he, he argues, can only increase. This disparity can only get larger. Suppose, for example, that the United States agrees today to pool our resources and share them with seven poor nations that have the same population size in aggregate as ours. Okay, so just let me make sure that proposal is clear to you. Our country has about 300 million people in the United States. So suppose that we set up an initiative to give aid to 300 million citizens of the third world, and that is divided among seven poor nations, which in aggregate add up to 300 million people. Okay, so like 300 million in the U.S., one country, seven poor countries with a net total population of 300 million. Suppose that today it's 2021 and we set up this assistance program from the 300 million American citizens to the 300 million citizens of the third world living in poverty. So what would be the ratio of those contributing aid to those that are recipients of aid today? Well, I've already told you it's 300 million to 300 million, so it's one to one. But would this ratio of those giving to those receiving remain one to one over like an 87 year time period? And that's where Hardin argues, no, what you'd expect to see is this. So it's 300 million to 300 million today. So, So at the beginning, it's one-to-one -one ratio. But what about after 35 years? Well, the poor nation has doubled after 35 years, so they're at 600 million. It'll take us 87 years to double. So after 87 years, we're at 600 million, but they got to 600 million after 35, and then they doubled again, so 1.2 billion after 70. And then 17 is like a third, halfway through a third cycle of doubling. So the ratio won't be the same. It'll be like 600 million versus maybe 2 billion or so. So it could be like 1 to 3 or 1 to 4. And he says, essentially, with these unchecked rates of greater reproduction in the third world, any well-intended but ultimately misguided attempt to offer such aid would result in an ever-increasing philanthropic burden that would eventually become unsustainable as the cohort of poor reproduce without any constraints propped up as they are through the provision of international aid, and then at some future date, when the system becomes untenable and unsustainable and you withdraw money from it, then you have an even larger cascade of dying off than you would have had if the number had been left smaller um, without, been, without the artificial support it receives from international aid in the first world. So he says, any policy of sharing resources would create an ever-increasing and ultimately unsustainable philanthropic load. And that's in a way, what he calls the tragedy of the commons. So um, the most famous idea of Garrett Hardin that I guess people ident identify with his work and remember about the things that he wrote is this tragedy of the commons principle that he's referring to right here. So the tragedy of the commons, I'll just put it here and describe it. <clears throat> Before I write that, though, let me just say, I mean, I'm, if it was just me, I'm, I'm more um, persuaded by the arguments and thoughts of Peter Singer than Garrett Hardin. I just kind of don't find Garrett Hardin's reasoning to be as, as uh, thorough and, and precise. One of the reasons for that is that he helps himself to certain assumptions that I'm not sure I would agree with. Like when he says that poor nations are going to reproduce much faster than the first world nations. Well, that's true today. But if they made a transition to a more developed living standard, in part through the provision of international aid, then we would expect them to join the ranks of the first world and developed nations where they would start to reproduce more slowly. And if the stated goal is to bring down rates of reproduction and population size, then I actually don't see how international aid would always be um, incompatible with that goal. So I, it's kind of like he's helping himself to this uncharitable assumption about the poor nations. They're poor today, poor tomorrow, and poor forever. They have like a static... Um, outlook in terms of how much faster they will always reproduce and what kind of standard of living that they will always have. So he doesn't really, I think, conceive of much possibility of movement from a poor uh, to a more developed living standard. And I think that helps him with his argument, but it's overlooking, I think, a real um, gap in the way he reasons. But anyway, the tragedy of the commons. So 
what this argument or principle says is that when you have public resources, things that are available not just for private parties but for the public to draw from, any publicly available resource, according to this thought, will, will uh, inevitably be ruined through overuse, overutilization, and poor management and poor upkeep. So public resources inevitably fail due to um, overuse and poor maintenance, unlike private resources. So it's basically don't support public resources, including things like the World Food Bank, which is a humanitarian program that's supposed to pool together resources from the first world to give them to the third world to help with their problems of poverty and starvation. But the tragedy of the commons says public resources are bad because they fail, and therefore it would be unwise and misguided to rely on them or to establish systems which institute them. Um, so let me give you his example. The example he gives to make this point is a case of like a hypothetical acre of farmland. Suppose there's one acre of farmland, and we open this acre to the public, meaning now who can use it? Anybody can. If you have farm animals and you want to let them graze or whatever, just bring them out to the public acre, and there's no restrictions on access. It's there for the public. It's open to all. So what will happen to that one acre of farmland, according to Garrett Hardin's thinking? Well, who will use it? Everyone will. And so there will be no limits on how many people can use it, so it will quickly be overutilized. There will be too many animals grazing on that one acre. And will any of those public uh, members of the commons, it's a commons, a commons is like a commonly accessible resource, so a good thing to remember. But this acre is our commons in the example. Will any of the people that are then utilizing the commons do their part to maintain its sustainability and upkeep, like tidy up after themselves and clean it and so on? Well, you'd think no, because what incentive would they have to do it? If the commons ends up being destroyed through overuse and poor man management, then no one's invested in it because it's not theirs in the first place. So they don't really kind of that much have a matching feeling of responsibility to care for its ultimate sustainability. So he thinks it's a recipe for failure. Everyone will use it. No one will clean up after themselves. And then you'll just have an acre that's been destroyed through overuse. And now no one can use it. But what if the one acre of farmland was privately owned? Would a private owner of his or her or their farmland um, place too many animals on it so that it would then be destroyed and not usable? No, because if so, they would lose the value of their own investment that they've put into it. So with private owners, you have every incentive to take care of something. I mean, if there were like public cars that anyone could just drive, do you think people would try to keep them clean and nice? Um, but when you own it as a private property, then you've invested in it, and it would be, of course, to your disadvantage to allow it to come to disrepair or um, ruin through, through your mismanagement, overuse, et cetera, of it. So he thinks with private resources, people have the matching incentive to take care of what they've invested in since it's theirs. And if they somehow destroy it through overuse or mismanagement, then they lose the value of their own investment. So private resources work out and they're sustainable, but public resources don't. And that's another reason that he's critical of the whole concept of international food aid programs like the World Food Bank, because he says that's another commons in disguise. In this case, the commons is the publicly available supply of consumable resources that everyone will draw from without limits, but will not wean themselves off of by uh, having children in lower numbers and developing a higher living standard. So eventually they draw from the commons, become too big through the aid and food. And then we have another problem where the cohort is too large to reasonably support any longer. So um, he figures that a lot of people want to support such programs because it's a humanitarian idea, but he thinks in the end, it's big business and special interests that sometimes actually um, stand to profit and gain from these programs, not the poor. Um, rail and shipment companies that have to ship food from point A to point B when we uh, set up these kind of food bank programs, make a taxpayer-funded kickback. Um, the administrators of the bureaucracies, which have to then administer this aid, also have a vested interest in perpetuating the existence of the bureaucracy, whether it helps people or not. So he's very skeptical about the efficacy of such aid. He sees it in a way as well-intended, but ultimately futile. And therefore, in the, in the end, again, he says, let's just treat the world as though we're each on our own lifeboats. And we just care about the one lifeboat that you're on. Um, it's kind of cold. It's a little indifferent to like 
the whole idea of like global commitments to others. At the end, he talks about immigration a little bit, and you can probably imagine that he's he's a fan of uh, very restricted immigration controls. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things about the, the arguments that he gives that I don't like, but I'll say this. Um, he provides probably the most intellectually presentable version of a lot of these debated points that are made in like the political arena, which oftentimes come across with, with a lot more uh, kind of sloppy and hot, heated language that's you know trading on tropes of like uh, uh, racist thought and anti-immigrant thought. So I don't know if I was if I was interested in this type of like theoretical position, then I would probably use the arguments of Garrett Hardin, which are more academic sounding at least than some of the rhetoric that you'll see out there on uh, social media, but but still, I don't agree with it. Anyway, guys, thanks again. I'm gonna let you go. I know it's 9.52, so we're gonna continue. We just have a little bit more before we start to our uh, review sessions for the midterm. We're gonna read um, the trolley problem, and that's what we'll study on Wednesday and Friday this week. So do read the trolley problem article by um, Judith Thompson, and I guess I'll see you guys back on Wednesday, and if you need anything, I'll be in touch. So have a good one, and uh, thanks again. Everyone's good to go? Okay, perfect. Great. Take care, then. I'll see you soon. <clears throat> thanks.